So up next, we have emergency management. So I'd like to call forward to my right here, please. Uh, Chief Joe Alphonse, I'd like to call on Kim Nimrava, Nimrava, pardon me if I mispronounced your last name, Rebecca Denlinger, and please note there was a change. It's, uh, we're fortunate to have um, the Regional Director General joining us today, um, Catherine Lapp of the Department of Crown and Indigenous Relations. So if you could please join us to have um, this panel on emergency management. You want to do it from there or do you want to do it from here? Perfect. Emergency management. <laughs> uh, the total presentation for everybody here is um, 20 minutes. So, so 45 minutes, but. Yeah. I've been honest. Chief uh, Joe Alphonse, I've been honest. I've been honest. Hi, I'm Chief Joe Alphonse, Tselkotin, uh, Tribal Chair, and also the Tladinkoch uh, Community Chief. Um, honored to be here in Musqueam Territory. Um, pleasure to, to do business here. Um, um, I wish all the candidates um, that are running in this election. Um, um, Best of luck. Um, we wish everyone well. I, um, just the two youth I, I, I didn't vote for, I, I figure, well, from my perspective, they should both be on there, I figured, so I'll, I'll leave it that way. Here to speak, I forgot I was actually going to be presenting here. Just come in for a coffee and got pulled up to a mic. Um, fire management, the uh, fires that we had, we've seen. Um, in the interior, you know, uh, just on the northern part of my community, I have 45% of the Chilcotin population comes from my community at Letting Co. Um, the other communities, um, when we, when I have nobody else to fight, I usually tell the other Chilcotin chiefs that that's why um, half the Chilcotin just requires one good chief and the other half five lesser chiefs. Just just to tease them. <laughs> anyway, um, the smaller communities have very large caretaker areas compared to my community. And I would say 75 to 80 percent of my community uh, caretaker areas burnt up this summer. Um, plateau fire. The plateau fire, um, if the fire guard that was established around that, if you if you clock that, that's a thousand kilometers. The Hansville fire, probably about 600 kilometers. So if that was a paved highway and you're doing 100 kilometers in your vehicle, that's 16 hours of straight driving. We had to deal with that. In 2009, 2010, my community was evacuated. And the experience that we had under that evacuation, 2010, we said we will never follow an evacuation order ever again. 
I will never surrender my authority to somebody else. I'm not a high school kid. You know how, how much people like, you know, to, to, to step in and order First Nation Indian people around. You know, when we, we evacuated in 2010, our people were packed in a gymnasium like this. Beds, cots, cot after cot after cot. It's like residential school. You go for lunch, supper, breakfast. Just like residential school, you go there. Feeding food that's culturally not appropriate. You know, I said, we are not doing this. In Williams Lake, when our people were at WL, Williams Lake Junior Secondary School, we also had other members that lived throughout the province of British Columbia come to help those community members. We had university students come. And in one case, yeah, two university students, one was in a master's program at UNBC. On the fourth day of the of the of volunteering, they finally find out that that there's a spare room for all the volunteers. So if they need a break, they can go there. There's refreshments. There's fruit. There's water. There's things to drink. There's TV. There's couch. If you want to have a nap, they finally find out on the fourth day. And then on the fourth day, they were walking into that room. And when they were walking in, two non-native teachers walking out, one says to the other, I don't trust them, stay behind, keep an eye on them. That, that, that made up our mind. I don't want to be a burden to anybody. And if non-native population views us as such, we're, we're not going to hell with them. We will look after ourselves as we've always done, generation after generation after generation. We better start preparing. You're gonna look after yourself. You're gonna, you're gonna take, you're gonna take that responsibility. You wanna talk self-government, prove it, do it. Don't just, don't just stand there and wait for meetings and talk, talk sovereignty and sound all so important. Do it. Them fires this past summer was not a threat to my community. Not even close. The threat was the RCMP, Ministry of Children and Families, regional districts. They were the threat. My pet peeve this summer was having a government official running into my office. How much people are left? Do you got a plan? What are you going to do? I said, oh, I'll... Worst comes the worst, we run down to the river. What are you going to do then? We're going to take our clothes off. But before we do, maybe we'll tie the babies to the log and push the log out in the river. Wow. Uh, we've survived fire. The Chilcotin is made of lodgepole pine. 75% is lodgepole pine. Lodgepole pine is dependent on forest fires. I think we know about forest fires. We're in grain. And my first job, I was, four, I was 14 years old, I fought fire. That was the first job I had. I spent all my teenage years fighting fire. Going through school. I knew if I fought fire for five weeks, I'd make more than the kids on the reserve that spent the whole summer working for the reserve. I had this height when I was 14, so I just was a little bit skinnier back then. <laughs> Put a big logger jacket on and away I'd go. I'm 18 years old, like that. So we come up with that plan. After 2010, we established an, um, our, our emergency evacuation policies. We're on version six. So when the fires hit, staff pulled that out, dropped it, says, we've got to follow this. 
this policy we, 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 we've, we established, we took our own practice from before contact. Before contact, we had lots of different chiefs. Having one chief in the community, that's not our way. That's not our way. That's, that's, that's a white man way. We had berry picking chief, we had salmon fishing chief, we had hunting chief, we had political chief, we had so on and so forth. When it's berry picking, the berry picking chief would say, this is where we're going, when we're going, nobody would argue and that was that. Same thing with hunting, same thing. But in times of crisis, we also had, when there was a threat to our community, our women, our children, we had our war chief. And in times of threat, everybody became subordinate to the war chief. So we took that concept. We developed our emergency response policy around that. There is no more band office. There is no more health director. There is no more chief and council. The majority of my council were long gone. With, we couldn't have a quorum or anything. So we had this emergency operations, we call it, based on our, and when you explain it that way, wow, your community just, they bought right into that. This is an old policy. You know, it took a crisis, but within that crisis, we achieved harmony in our community. Everyone in our community, everybody had a role to play. You wanted to fight fire, you, we got a job for you. You want to be a cook, we got a cook for you. Even the youth. It got to the point where my eight-year-old nephew said he was upset because he didn't have a job. He wanted a job. He wanted to be a firefighter. Told him he wasn't tall enough. <laughs> Told him you're a night watchman. You look after the house down there. So every night you go, you go up to the window and you check all the windows and make sure there's no fire. So he'd do that till about 10 o'clock till he'd fall, fall asleep. You know, took that crisis, but we got harmony. It was nice that two month period. It was nice to be in that community to see. You know, when we, if we left, I, I figure we would have lost 30 homes. I figure we would have lost our health building, our ban office, our store. We saved all of that. You know, I got elected chief eight and a half years ago. My community faced about a $5 million deficit. Even if we lost five homes, we, we, we can't afford that. You know, we had to make a stand. And when we start making that stand, holy smokes, get on social media and Williams Lake, boy, I was a target for sure. How upsetting it is for people, government, non-Aboriginal people, that First Nation people are standing up on them for themselves. It's time. Let's go to see in Astila, Alexandria community, band members coming up to me and telling me they walked into the CRD regional district office and the front end staff are all upset. They're all calling me down. They want to have the chance, opportunity to point and dictate to us no freaking way. You know, it's be prepared. Every community should have an emergency response. We're working on version seven now after this fire season. You know, it's, it sounds romantic, but you gotta be prepared. It's, it's, it's a lot of stress, it's a lot of hard work. But in the end, I do it again in a heartbeat. And I, I, you know, I, I strongly encourage every First Nation, if you don't have a plan, start now. Never too late. We're in the age of global warming now. Eight years I've been 
half, eight and a half years I've been chief, and this is the third evacuation. And it wasn't even the first crisis in my community. We had washout on Highway 20 due to flooding just be two weeks before the fires start. So my message here, and I think I do want to acknowledge out of all the, all the uh, government agencies that we had to deal with, um, I was uh, quite inspired to see uh, INAC, um, Regional District, um, um, Catherine Lapa, um, new to the job, you know, I, I said their policies are to impoverish us. Two days after she showed up in my community with a chopper, dealt, made accommodation. You know, we were prepared to, we were prepared to walk away from everything, you know. Didn't matter, we were gonna stay, we were gonna fight, but she made accommodations for our community reports, you know, every year. We're 144 reports, financial reports, audits that we have to go through. You're late five minutes on one and bingo, the, all the financial stop. But under this crisis, she, was, she waved that flag and said, you know, we will make sure that you guys continue to receive your funding and so on and so forth. So that, that, that really pulled us through. Um, lots more to say, lots, a uh, lot of issues. Um, um, the highlight for me, I guess, was, uh, you know, the, um, well, maybe the most shocking thing was uh, how quickly when you were in form of evacuation order, how quickly RCMP and stuff quickly reverted right back to we're going to bring Ministry of Children and Families in, we're going to remove all your children. Like how quickly, you know, the first sign of confrontation that, that just, boom, it's a threat right now. I said, well, you ain't coming in our community, we're going to roadblock you guys. And I um, said, well, well, um, your roadblocks won't slow us down. I said, well, maybe roadblocks won't slow you down, but bullets flying past your head, I sure guarantee it's gonna slow you down. So my highlight was I, I threatened the RCMP and I got away with it. <laughs> That's how I spend my summer, so. so. Anybody else wanna try it? Good luck. <laughs> Thanks. I'm going to make my way down the list as it's presented in the agenda. So next would be uh, Kim Namrava from the Canadian Red Cross. You're welcome to stay there or come to the podium as you see fit. Kim. So microphone number two, please. Thank you. And if you could tell me how to pronounce your name properly, it'd be great. Um, thank you so much. I'm uh, Kimberly Namrava, the Vice President with Canadian Red Cross responsible for British Columbia and Yukon. Um, I want to start by uh, thanking the Musqueam people for inviting us onto their territory to uh, do this work today, so thank you. And uh, the, I'd also like to acknowledge the many First Nation communities that we've worked with and, and visited this summer, during this summer and during the fires, and thank them for welcoming, welcoming Red Cross workers onto their territory and to uh, share in their, in their work as they recover from these fires and build back better. I do need to acknowledge just the, the impact of these fires on, uh, on the land, on the people, and could not help but be, um, feel deeply the impact for everyone when I was had the opportunity to walk on the land with some of the First Nation leaders and, and see firsthand and feel firsthand what the charred land and what the landscape felt like and hear the impact on the traditional um, gathering sites, the traditional medicines, the impact on the wildlife and just that connection to the land and it truly, truly profound uh, impact for everyone. And with that, a huge respect and acknowledgement of the leadership and the resilience that we saw during the evacuations. There's no doubt in my mind is that the, the local leadership and the Good Samaritans and the 
communities coming together were what saved lives this summer and what allowed us to go through this horrific fire season without, without losing lives to people evacuated, trying to evacuate. And uh, just seeing what we're seeing right now in California where many, many lives are being lost and just being so thankful for um, the fact that we were able to protect our people. And just to seeing that the leadership and complimenting that. I also want to compliment the outpouring of generosity that uh, we saw to so many people uh, from First Nation communities in helping not only their communities but helping other people, helping evacuees and strangers. And again, that really brings the, the true humanitarian spirit that, uh, that comes alive during these times of, of uh, stress and times of disaster. Uh, as a neutral humanitarian organization, the Red Cross is proud to work alongside all levels of government in providing humanitarian assistance. And we have had the opportunity, thanks to the generous donations of Canadians, uh, the support, generous support of the government of British Columbia and the government of Canada to have a fund to support people affected by this fire season. We're supporting in three large streams of support. The first is to individuals and families. And this support uh, was initiated with the emergency financial assistance to individuals and families in the form of uh, $600 for people who were evacuated, $300 for people re-entering, and $600 recurring during the uh, people who were on evacuation order for two weeks or longer. Most of those funds have been distributed, but we are continuing to track down some of the com complex cases where people have different addresses or were in a different community and uh, make sure that we're reaching as many people as possible to distribute that assistance. The individuals and family support is also now moving to case-by-case -case assistance. This is where we can meet with families and provide assistance based on their situation, the number of children they have, the situation that they're in in terms of um, their employment and their vulner any vulnerabilities that they may be facing. It is also allowing us to distribute assistance like um, of fridges, replacing fridges for people whose fridges were destroyed because of uh, losing power for multiple weeks and we're doing a delivery, for example, I believe this coming Monday into Anaheim Lake to uh, support some of those families affected. The support to, small uh, support to individuals and families will continue in the weeks and months ahead and again this will be on a case-by-case -case basis and just a reminder is that if families find that a few months from now or weeks from now that they need support where they didn't think they needed it before, please encourage them to contact us because this is not something that if they, if they don't need assistance right now, it doesn't mean they can't come to us for assistance later. The second stream of support is to small business, um, not-for-profit agencies and First Nation cultural livelihoods. The first phase of this support is cash grants in the amount of $1,500 uh, for people, for small business, not-for-profits, and First Nation cultural livelihoods applying to this, to this stream. And this is to support in those extraordinary expenses that these uh, organizations or businesses would have undergone because of the evacuation. Similar to individuals and families, uh, the next phase of support to small business will soon be announced. And again, this will be done on a case-by-case -case basis with families working directly with um, our managers to be able to adapt and assess their needs on a case-by-case, -case, which allows it to be, to be aligned to, to what their needs are. The third stream of support is community partnerships. This is a very flexible stream of support. 
and we really encourage First Nation bands um, organi and not-for-profit organizations, local government to apply to the community partnerships. This can be used for initiatives like uh, healing ceremonies, welcoming back ceremonies. It can, has already been used to support funding for traditional harvesting or hunting where groups have had to go further afield to provide, to find food. And really, this is a stream where we are working closely with the leadership and, and invite the leadership and the members of the community to consider how can they not only recover from um, the fires, but if they incurred expenses because of their fires, if they hosted um, communities or incurred ex extraordinary expenses because of the fires, this can also be applied retroactively to when the fires first occurred. The important piece about this one and the, the why community partnerships are really quite exciting is that these are truly led by the community and this is where we turn to the community for their leadership and their determination of how, what will best support uh, their people in the weeks, months, and even years ahead as they, as they uh, recover and prepare for the next disaster. The final stream of support under community partnerships is disaster risk reduction. And these are initiatives for families and communities to be better prepared for the next you know, set of fires. This is done in coordination with other agencies providing disaster risk reduction initiatives. So certainly we don't want to duplicate assistance and we are working with these other agencies like Finesse um, to determine how we can ensure that what we fund in disaster risk reduction complements the work that they're funding. Finally, when we look at uh, moving ahead, it's also how we can work with your community to be better prepared and make sure that when a disaster occurs, it's not the first time that we're meeting or discussing this, but uh, we can, how we can support you, not only large-scale disasters, but also small-scale disasters that occur every day. The Canadian Red Cross has an indigenous framework that we operate under. This was uh, recently approved by our board in June of 2017, and there are four key aspects of the indigenous framework. One is the adoption of a spirit of reconciliation, acknowledging the past history of indigenous people in Canada and making sure that we're honoring the recommendations in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The second is to work with the leadership in our work with Indigenous people. The third, to build among our personnel a constant and ongoing learning and uh, creation of safe, culturally safe and aware and uh, culturally safe and aware environments. And the fourth is um, having programs and services that truly build capacity and have a positive impact for people that we're working with. And finally, I would uh, encourage you certainly and welcome you to reach out to me or any of our Red Cross workers to find out more information on any of these initiatives and encourage you as leaders uh, to remember to take care of yourself. These fires have been a huge drain on our leadership and um, my experiences in working with leaders is that they're, they're often the last ones to take care of themselves. They're, they're so busy taking care of other people. And so, you know, we remind people, at, at Red Cross we remind people to make sure that the leadership also takes care of yourself so that uh, we can, that you can continue the great work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. And we're going to turn now to Rebecca De um, Benlinger, is that correct? And that's Dep she's Deputy Minister of Emergency Management, British Columbia, and she's on microphone three, please. 
Good morning, everyone. I too would like to acknowledge that we're meeting on the territory of the Musqueam people, and I'm uh, grateful for the invitation to join you here at this important gathering. I have, have notes that I got from my office, and as I sit and listen to you this morning, I've been scribbling all over them. They're a big mess now. Of course, because what I hear from you or when I sit in the room is far more important than anything that I thought of when I sat in my office over in Victoria. Um, and one thing top of mind for me, I also want to acknowledge the sound of the rain hitting the roof. And I know that soon, if you live on the island, on Vancouver Island, the fall flooding season will be on us. I, I work with Emergency Management British Columbia. We call it EMBC if you're not familiar with us. Um, this past spring and summer, all across British Columbia, we experienced unprecedented wildfires and floods. First we had the floods before the floods were even over. In fact, the Okanagan Lake is still not returned to its normal pool level. Before the floods were over, we were beset by these wildfires. We know that First Nations communities have been disproportionately impacted by these floods and fires. Emergency Management BC has had the privilege of supporting many of your communities through these difficult events. And um, I think it's important to understand that Emergency Management BC is organized to support communities that are dealing with emergencies. The idea is that in most every case, at least 99% of the time, Communities are well organized to support themselves, but once in a while they need help. And it's Emergency Management BC's role to understand how best to support each and every community where it lives with the emergency it faces. Emergency Management BC did a lot of work over the summer. In fact, we worked as hard as we know how to do, and we did everything we know how to do. And we know now that we must learn to do better, that we have to learn more about the communities that we're working with to be able to support them and give them what they need, where they live, and where they are on the ground. We know firsthand of the tremendous efforts that First Nations took to support their own communities, and in many cases to support the thousands of people who were forced to flee their homes, uh, people that you had never met, that you may not ever meet again, but you opened your homes and your land to help take care of them. Now, I'm proud of Emergency Management BC's work over the past summer, and I also know that we have to make improvements. We're committed to learning from the events and to working with all of you to identify the best way to improve the work that we do. We want to learn better so that we can better support every community in British Columbia and including all the First Nations people. So we want to be able to, to better support all the people in the future. Our staff out in the region are already working with communities to aid in recovery and to find ways to improve. So I want to talk a little bit about the plan that we have for hearing, sitting and listening and hearing what you have to say so that we can understand how better to, to, to meet your needs in the future. There's a newly established recovery branch that's working with First Nations, with local governments, and with key partners like the Red Cross to develop strategies that will meet the unique needs of communities across the province. And as Kimberly said, a, a foundational tenet of that approach is to understand what it takes in every situation. What, what are the unique needs of communities and what do the communities say? What's the community's plan for recovery and how can Emergency Management BC and our partners support that. Based on what we've learned during the flooding and wildfire events, Emergency BC is working on some improvement strategies and I want to share those with you now. We've designed our review process with a focus on First Nations, a de dedicated and supported line of effort that links to the overall strategy that will carry on similar conversations with other communities as well. We've hired an indigenous contractor who's been coordinating with First Nations Emergency Services Society and First Nations communities together with our regional staff to hear about what worked well and what improvements are required. We'll be sharing her recommendations with all First Nations communities. We'll also be holding engagement sessions with communities so that we can start a dialogue and seek solutions together. These 
sessions will be held in communities that were directly impacted by this year's floods and wildfires, but all First Nations communities are invited to participate. Uh, we recognize that even if you didn't get caught up in it this year, maybe you did last year, maybe you will next year, and every community is unique. EMBC can also provide support for First Nations communities to hold their own community debrief sessions. We're providing funding for this. We know some First Nations communities have already started to hold these sessions, and we welcome any information that's already been collected from which we can learn. We're also planning a provincial, a province-wide after action a review session for January and all affected communities will be invited to attend that. So the way it will work is we have a line of effort that's specific and focused on First Nations and we'll be uh, talking with First Nations communities to understand how we did what we need to improve on. We'll be doing the same thing in other communities and there'll be links across so that you, everyone will be invited to sit and talk together as well. In addition to the post-event planning and reviewing that we're doing, I also want to share some of the other work that Emergency, B Emergency Management BC has underway to support First Nations communities in their emergency preparedness efforts. We'll soon be providing enhanced emergency management training in First Nations communities. Several communities that would like to participate have already reached out to us and will receive training before the end of March. We look forward to these training opportunities and opportunities to better design our training materials and make them more valuable for First Nations communities, more appropriate to meet your needs. Finesse has also assisted us in hiring new staff members in our regional offices. Uh, these staff members will focus on supporting First Nations communities that want to develop emergency plans and participate in preparedness activities. Again, a dedicated stream of staffing. In partnership with the First Nations Emergency Services Society, we would like to develop a First Nations advisory group to help us improve in all of our work, our planning, our preparedness, our response, our mitigation, and our recovery efforts. This advisory group will have representation from all areas of the province. Overall, as an organization, EMBC commits to work with you and learn from community, from you and your communities in all matters emergency management. We recognize and honor the traditional knowledge with respect to planning and preparedness, food preparation and preservation, and your traditional knowledge of the land and water. During the recent flooding and wildfire events, we learned a great deal from First Nations communities about how these types of impact, events impact the landscape what actually has happened over time and over the centuries and what we can expect, including the impacts to wildlife and the impacts to traditional food sources. So again, thank you for the invitation to join the panel today. I know that there's a lot of work ahead of EMBC and we very much look forward to the opportunity to collaborate with you and to learn from you to ensure that all our families are prepared and stay safe during emergencies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I now invite Catherine Lepid to come forward. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be with you here today, and uh, I appreciate uh, the Musqueam people for uh, having us on their land. I'm going to speak from the mic because I know it is really hard to project with, uh, with the rain here. Um, you've heard a lot already, and I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about what we've done, but maybe turn our minds a little bit as well to what still needs to be done. Um, there were tremendous successes, as uh, Becky and others have, uh, have shared, um, and there's lots more work to be done to ensure that uh, in the inevitable situation that these uh, situations occur again, that we're better prepared, we're better coordinated, and better uh, resourced to address these issues moving forward. I will start by saying I am Catherine Lapa, but I'm not the RDG of Crown and Indigenous Relations. Um, as you know um, about governments, we're really good at doing some things quickly, like appointing new ministers to new roles, but it takes a lot longer to move the bureaucracy. Um, and so my title is still Regional Director General of, I of the department that will soon formally be known as INAC. Um, but uh, likely uh, the responsibilities of the region will be more under the Indigenous Services side of things. 
Um, so first of all, I mean, I, you know, Becky talked a little bit about um, the agreement that we have with the NBC. We do provide resources to NBC in order to ensure that First Nations are fully integrated into the provincial system. INAC does not have the boots on the ground to, uh, to be able to uh, provide the support that EMBC is able to lever. And so it's really important as we move forward that we have a tripartite approach that fully recognizes the responsibilities, the authority, the capabilities, the skills, um, and the needs of First Nations communities. And so although we had concluded the agreement on April 1st of last year, we had not fully had the opportunity to get to communities together to talk about what that looks like moving forward. So as we talk about a tripartite agreement, I think there's a real opportunity to ensure that there's greater clarification of roles and responsibilities, expectations and service standards as we move forward. And we hope to get your feedback on how you want to be engaged and how we can move forward in that regard. Um, for those of you that were able to join, on very short notice I acknowledge, the Joint Task Force of Cabinet Ministers that met uh, between the province and the federal government um, last month. Um, it was enormously important for those cabinet ministers to hear firsthand from communities and to uh, recognize uh, what had happened. Uh, one of the things that was discussed at that meeting, as you may have heard, is um, that uh, the federal, provincial, and territorial ministers of emergency management have been having discussions, and in some cases with the AFN, about doing an inventory on capacity and capabilities and that's being led by public safety and I've had a number of conversations with public safety about that moving forward it's still very much in its infancy but I think we would like to advocate that uh, the BC uh, be the first jurisdiction to move forward in that regard in terms of really getting a full inventory of the capabilities because I think as we get that full inventory it becomes easier and clearer about how to integrate that along with the provincial system moving forward. So I think there's some tremendous opportunity there that we can, uh, we can uh, uh, leverage going forward. Um, as we were dealing with the emergency, um, and I think Becky talked to some of this, there was a lot of real-time improvements that had to take place. As the depth and breadth of the emergency uh, was identified, and also um, as needs were, became clearer. And so we at INAC did try and do what we could um, to try and do new things um, and look forward to hearing what more you think we need to do moving forward. So for the first time ever, we worked with uh, some of the First Nations like Tecumlips and Takla and our, and our own um, folks uh, to uh, issue status cards on an emergency basis, recognizing that people in fact did not have identification when they were evacuating on such short notice. And I think that, that was valuable for those trying to access services, um, Red Cross support and others, but um, moving forward. Um, we did, as uh, um, Chief Alphonse indicated, put on hold um, the reporting of financials and other reports uh, for communities. And let me be clear, anything we've done for Kletno, we've done for other communities and we'll do for any and all of you <laughs> moving forward. Um, and so we were able to advance resources in some cases where communities needed it um, and uh, to try and find support, provide support as we could along the way. We've been visiting communities um, very much in partnership with other agencies and I do want to really acknowledge here uh, the work of the First Nations Health Authority and the First Nations Emergency Society as being really essential and crucial partners um, uh, moving forward and uh, that we've been visiting communities together in order to ensure that we're getting feedback and hearing the same things and immediately thinking of how we can do better, do more, and be more coordinated moving forward. There's lots that can be said about the response and recovery phases. On the recovery phases, we are working with the NBC closely to make sure that claims are being processed quickly, that we are trying to seamlessly um, interpret those claims to make sure that we're levering both uh, the DFAA and the emergency management policies that INAC have, which allow us to interpret as broadly as possible to ensure that we're building back better, as the policy is called. So um, in closing, I just want to thank all of you for listening um, and to really uh, acknowledge all uh, the chiefs, the councils, the communities, the firefighting crews uh, uh, all throughout uh, the last uh, season. Both the floods and the fires have had a tremendous impact on communities and I commit that we will be with you through the long haul to try and address your issues going forward and look forward to hearing your feedback here and in the sessions that uh, Becky has identified going forward. So thank you very much. I see already a question from the floor. Uh, microphone number nine, please. Wait. 
Gurkhi Ronigny, Skeetis and Swapahulu. This is Chief Ronigny from Skeetis and Swapahulu. Um, yeah, it was quite an interesting summer. Uh, the fire raging at our doorstep, Skeetison. As a matter of fact, we, I, I say that uh, our community, we lived in the chimney of the fire. Uh, it was, it was, the, the smoke was so bad. And uh, what, it was really interesting in that uh, the RCMP, I, we found out by accident that there was a uh, notice of, uh, not an emergency notice, uh, of, of evacu not evacuation, but he noticed that uh, there was uh, danger of fire uh, all around us. All the non-native people got notified by us, and I found out by, by accident, uh, I ran into the RCMP sitting in our coffee shop, and I said, what do, what, what, how come there's six policemen here? What's going on? He said, oh, we're handing out our uh, notices and warning people about the fire. And I said, well, nobody said anything to us. Uh, because you're giving notice out to all the non-native people all around us. So I went home and we said, the hell with them. We're not going to wait for anybody. We're not going to depend on anybody. And we began preparing and organizing. We set up our own uh, emergency center, our own uh, plans, and began doing the job of defending our community and preparing for the defense of our community. Uh, but rather than getting really angry, what we did is we began, I, I began building bridges out uh, to, the, uh, to the firefighters, uh, to, uh, to outside community, and letting them know that we, have, uh, that we have a role in this fire. This is our homeland that's on fire. And so we, uh, I invited the, the, um, the firefighting camp to come and move over to our, uh, to set up their camp on our reserve as they had to move. And when they came in, I uh, invited Cookby Christian and other members of our council to, uh, to welcome them into our community. And uh, we did a ceremony, a, a smudging ceremony. Uh, and as I turned around, uh, there was uh, a whole line of firefighters behind us waiting to be smudged as well. So <laughs> I told them, you guys are doing a hell of a job smudging us already. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, but uh, and we gave them a history of our our territory, of the importance of the land, the wildlife, the food plants, the medicinal plants up there. That's what they're fighting for. They're defending that for us. And when we got when we already originally got there, there were 300 individual firefighters fighting a fire. When we left, I'm convinced that there was a team of 300 firefighters with a mission and a vision. And uh, we also, we also uh, appointed representatives from our community to go up to the mountains to, to tell them where, where best to put the fire breaks, where best, uh, which way the winds were blowing in which valley in, in the morning, in, in the afternoon. We sent, we, we had our people going out and GPSing the fires, exactly, the exact boundaries of the fire. Their infrared mapping was, was an approximation. And so we were able to, uh, to be much more, make them much more effective and efficient firefighters. But on the mean, meanwhile, what, uh, what they had done to a group of our Sukhwapan firefighters is rather than keeping them at home to fight the fire in the territory that, they well, that they're very well familiar with, they were sent way up north, and, the, and they were phoning back to us and saying, hey, we're lost. Can you get somebody to find us? <laughs> you know, we've got to keep the people in their territory that know their territory to fight the fire in their territory. And we even had our own firefighters go and try to volunteer, and they said, you're, 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 not, uh, you're not experienced enough. <laughs> uh, that was, uh, so we had a... And uh, as it turned out, the non-native communities around us, oh, and the, the other thing that we did, the uh, RCMP were... Could give, be, Ron, I'm just going to ask you to... to uh, this is important. I understand I, I it's to, important. I need to talk about it. This I understand is an important issue. It's a life and death issue, you know? Uh, it's it's got to be discussed. We've got to know. We've got to develop a plan. 
and we know the problems, the issues here. The RCMP were getting lost in the mountains, and we had to uh, send a person around so they could know where to do, how to do their work properly. We have a role that, what, what, has ha what has got to happen here is the provincial government has got to quit managing the forest for fiber for the mills. They got to begin managing the forest for water. And we have to be able to take back our management tool of, of fire. For thousands of years, we managed those forests using our uh, fire as a tool. We got to be able to take that back. And I'm, going, and I'm, I'm moving in that direction myself. I've done so already been able to bring back two keystone plants as a use of fire and getting rid of uh, invasive species. There's much that we can learn from each other, and, uh, but we need to work together on this. And a lot of our Shushwab communities were invisible. I, I listened to all the Shushwab chiefs. They weren't even, uh, and some of them were even shut out. They weren't even, their cries for help were ignored while their houses burned, you know? That there is, a, there is a, uh, I have to say, there is a curtain between us and the non-native community when it comes to uh, emergency preparedness. And we got to, as nations of people, we got to put together our own emergency preparedness plan and uh, look forward to working with my fellow Cook Peace and Shushwap country to do that. Uh, it's uh, what happened here uh, exposed a lot of uh, things that weren't very nice that we need to get get straightened out in this country. Thank you. Thank you very much. It sounds like, uh, from what I hear, we heard some lessons learned from one territory, a snippet of lesson learned, and perhaps it's something that you may want to consider dedicating a day to this somewhere uh, for closely down the road with these fresh lessons learned and how to move forward in a good way. It's just a remark as an observer here. I do have the electoral officer next to me, so I'm just going to stop here and, and check in with him. Good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> sorry to interrupt. Uh, we have completed the ballot counts. Thank you all for turning up this morning. It was a great turnout. Pleasure to see you all. Um, so I'll make uh, three announcements here, one for the uh, position of youth, female youth representative, one for uh, the four positions available for the board, on the board of directors, and one for the regional chief. So first of all, um, there were two candidates for youth representative, Angela Charlie and Adina Williams. Angela Charlie received 69 votes. Uh, Adina Williams received 67, so a very close run race. And congratulations to, uh, to Angela. Uh, for the board of directors, there were uh, four positions available, uh, two for the balance of an existing term and two for a two-year term. Uh, the candidates who received the top number, the two uh, highest number of votes um, uh, are uh, uh, successful candidates for the two-year term. Uh, the votes were, and I'll just read them in order here, um, for uh, Willie Blackwater, 59, for Daryl Bob, 75, for Harvey McLeod, 87, for Susan Miller, 106, for Charles Morvan, 76, and for Marilyn Slett, 96 which means that the successful candidates for the two-year term are Susan Miller and Marilyn Slett, and the two successful candidates for the balance of the existing term are Harvey McLeod and Charles Morvan. Congratulations. <laughs> and uh, uh, drum roll, please. The, uh, the uh, regional chief uh, uh, ballot, uh, we had two people on the ballot, two candidates on the ballot, Maureen Chapman and Terry TG. Uh, Maureen received 70 votes and Terry received 70 votes. So that's a tie. So we run into a second ballot. Uh, so um, my understanding is that we will have the, uh, the polls open for an hour uh, over lunchtime. Uh, so those of you who voted, please come out and vote again. And um, those of you who didn't, please come and join us. And uh, if you know anybody you can call in uh, to come and vote, please, uh, please invite them to come in. Uh, but uh, once lunch is called, the, uh, the polls will be open again. If you'd please come and uh, vote one more time, um, just for the chief position this time, and we'll try and break this tie. Thank you. At noon. It will be at noon. Um, but if but if something if it if it goes over noon, well, I'll open at noon and then 
uh, you come as you see fit after that. Thank you. Uh, and I've just been told as well that we are no longer accepting proxies. Um, so the, the, uh, all the proxies are closed at this point in time. Um, so uh, if, you, if you have a proxy, um, please come and vote. And, uh, but if, you, if uh, there's no uh, opportunity at this point in time to, uh, to appoint new proxies. Okay, thank you. So just for clarity, because I'm, I'm wrinkling my eyebrow too. So if you hold a proxy and it registered, great, you can proceed. If you're looking to pass it or transfer it, at this time, my understanding is it's not possible. Is that correct, Marcus? That is correct. So just make sure that you get it. So if you're holding one, yes, please go vote. If you're trying to leave or you have a plane, it's not an opportunity to transfer that to somebody else at this time, just to be clear. So thank you again very much uh, to uh, Microphone 9, Cook B, Ron Ignace. Going over to Microphone 19, um, please proceed, uh, Chief Vivian. Good morning, Chief Vivian Tom with Wet'suwet'en First Nations in Burns Lake. Um, I have a question for Kim Nimrava and Rebecca Denling Denlinger. Um, like, actually, well, what's what's the best practice to fight against smoke inhalation, especially for shut-ins? And then the second question was. Um, are you able to disclose the full amount of donations and surplus um, left over from the donations to the Red Cross? And um, I sort of have a recommendation. Um, can you use the surplus to buy a new fire truck for each of the First Nations communities affected by the wildfire because especially for some of these communities that are isolated. Um, I'm just going to interrupt you, Vivian, because there's a, quite a bit of chatter right now. I, I kindly ask for your cooperation. If you need to continue a conversation, to kindly remove yourself from this main space, or if possible, please wrap up so we can hear you properly. Thank you very much. OK. Um, I just this again. I'm just going to kindly interrupt and say, can you please take your conversations out? It's a lot of chatter going on. I know it's an exciting time about the votes, but please kindly respect the assembly in session right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for the firefighting in each of the regions, um, this was brought up in our community in the Burns Lake area, which is uh, central BC. Um, a lot of the local firefighters were never called, even though they received all the tickets that they needed to, to go out and fight the fires. And this was an issue that was brought up, is why were the firefighters from all over the world brought in when we had our own local firefighters that were First Nations, that knew the area, and yet they were never called. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. So I know there was one uh, re directed to Re Rebecca or Becky, whatever you prefer. I didn't quite hear the question on smoke inhalation. Okay. So what, what's the best practice to fight against smoke inhalation, okay. especially for the elderly and the shut-ins and um, individuals that have compromised health or lung health issues? Thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, with respect to smoke inhalation, I, I, I agree it is a huge issue. I'm not a health professional, so I do know that we defer to the ministries of health or First Nation Health um, to, to provide the recommendations on when people should move and, of course, people's own physicians. So uh, maybe you can... Chief Tom, we'll follow up and get you an answer back. And uh, with respect to the Canadian Red Cross Society Fund, to date we've raised $19.9 and spent approximately $5 million of that, uh, so $19.9 million nationwide. The use of the fund actually continues really along the same streams that I've uh, allocated out, the individuals and families, small business and community partnerships. And where uh, most of the funding to date has been spent 
is supporting individuals and families who have exceptional needs. So we've used the money when, just some examples where um, some evacuees uh, had a son that needed medical treatment and needed to be, um, uh, needed, the family needed to travel to Vancouver to get him to Vancouver Children's Hospital. So would support those type of special needs. We used some of the funds to provide some traditional food to uh, First Nation elders who were in um, a shelter. We, so we use the Red Cross funds to provide humanitarian assistance outside of what is provided by government or insurance companies or other needs. I, and maybe Becky can speak to um, furnishing fire departments with, um, with fire trucks. That is not actually within the mandate of the Canadian Red Cross in our, in our charitable purpose as an organization. We don't generally do um, fire truck provision, but we certainly are more than welcome to discuss what other needs your community may have to support either what happened during the fires or moving ahead. Uh, microphone three, please. With respect to the um, idea of purchasing fire trucks, that's exactly the sort of discussion that we'd like to have when we have the uh, sessions, the after action review sessions, so that we can understand exactly how that would help the situation, so that we'd have a better outcome in the future. So. Uh, if you could please ensure that you're either you are able to attend or someone representing your interest can attend one of those sessions so that we can get your input and that idea on the table. It's, um, we've heard it once or twice before as well. It's um, something that we'd like to take a look at and consider. You also asked about the firefighters, uh, your firefighter team who are certified and weren't called into action. I'm not able to speak to that. The BC Wildfire Service made decisions about who, who to employ and, and where to put them, but I will ask them to provide an answer to you on that and follow up. Thank you. So we'll go over to microphone number 23, please. Uh, thank you for your presentations. Uh, I'm really happy to hear that you're going to gather all the First Nations that were affected by the fires and the evacuations and review how things could have been better. And I would certainly turn to all available government agencies and levels of funding to ensure that we can build a better path. Uh, when I think of the forest fires, I remember when it was really in the thick of it, I heard rumor that there was a forest fire on Guilford Island and I immediately went into panic. Our community is a fly-in community. Let's use a house fire as, as an example. If one of our houses caught on fire, I believe we would have between 15 and 30 minutes of water to use to put that house out. And then that would be it. And so certainly fire is something that's a, I mean, I went absolutely into a panic when I heard about this rumor but it caused me to pause and think about what we have to do to be able to prevent that fire. Mention a fire department. If we were to phone a fire department, we'd have to wait for the barge to arrive in Fort McNeil and load it up and a couple hours into the village and get there to maybe help. And so I know our community is not as wonderful and unique as it is. I know the situation is not unique, that many First Nations face this same situation. So when I look at the recommendations from Grand Chief Ed John's report here and the proposal, uh, reviewing certainly number one and number three are really important to our First Nation. And so we need to be able to examine how do we address the situation that I just described. And I recall some of the talk that I heard about going out and doing the clearing of available fuel for fires around communities that very action of removing it increased the potential for more fires. And so I think that during the winter months is a, is a time that we need to examine what needs to be done. And then we need to make the available resources available to communities so they can get this work done when it's not a risk of causing a fire. And so when the fire season is upon us that we've dealt with available fuel as best we can instead of letting it grow all year. But I think we really need to take this seriously. It's a long-term 
Uh, I believe, uh, as a result of global warming, that we really need to make a very serious effort to ensure the safety of our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, microphone four, please. Just wanted to make a comment about uh, smoke. Um, smoke is a big threat. Um, we lived in smoke for two months. You have to have a plan and your health department should have an idea who, who in your community all has breathing issues, heart issues, all of that stuff. And you know, you, just because we said no to the evacuation order doesn't mean we did not have a plan. We had a plan. We were shifting our people throughout the province constantly. And if, if at all, at any point, the preference is to send them off to another First Nation com community elsewhere where they'll be looked after from a First Nation perspective where they're, they're fed culturally appropriate food. Um, and if you're gonna evacuate, my advice is to evacuate them as far away as you can. You know, for my community, 100 mile, uh, or Williams Lake wasn't far enough, they, Williams Lake ended up getting evacuated too. So I would tell them, take my members either to, to Prince Rupert or Nanaimo get as far away, but as it turns out, the majority of our elders spent, spent the summer in um, Abbotsford, um, Stolo territory, where they were looked after by Stolo Nation, so those nations, thank you. Um, another point, um, um, INA Canada has offloaded its responsibility to EMBC. A fire hazard, a crisis, is no different than, than logging exploration, mining exploration, where you're supposed to be consulted, where every aspect you should be consulted, where you have input, a fire and a crisis like this, the same situation has to occur and you, you have to demand it. You know, I threatened to kick all the firefighters out of the Chilcotin territory. So we don't care. If you're not gonna follow us, then, then, then we're gonna let the whole freaking thing burn. It's those white ranches you guys will have to deal with after, after the fact. If you don't want to work with us, we'll kick everybody out. Hell, let it all burn. So then and only then, why do we have to resort to that in order to get the government's ear? Justin Trudeau, we met with him during the fire, talked about these things. I said, you know, EMBC and others have to listen to us. Those are our dollars. We have to be heard. You know, we, we did our own BCR, but we, we didn't submit that to CRD or any regional district. We did it, Tlaiskote and CRD, and we did our own governance. That's what you have to do. You sign that BCR, boy, you're handing over all that power. I'll advise you, you cannot be evacuated unless you sign a BCR for your community. Educate yourself. You know, do it on your own. Stand up on your own. Do it, take that challenge on. We've made mistakes, oh boy, we did. But man, we learned from that. I told Justin Trudeau, you know, all the problems we had with the province, CRD, and everyone. And he talked about the challenges he had. I told him, you know what, I think, uh, I think the conclusion I come, come up with is that uh, BC is definitely a problem. And as it turns out, they're not in the room. So let's just cut them right out of the whole equation. Let's just go Canada and in the Chilcotin, maybe we'll just have a Canada and Saiskot in law, no BC, kick them right out. He said, I think that might be a little bit challenging. <laughs> but the message, be prepared, develop your laws. Finance, another big part, like every last single transaction we did, boy, we, I told them make it, make that so that it's prepared for an audit because boy, everybody's gonna be looking at us from every angle, hoping we're gonna fall flat on our face. You know, have faith in your firefighters. We, we trained 500 firefighters since 2010. We have some of the best heavy equipment operators. You know, if, if I don't have the best firefighting equipment you can get as a bulldozer, if your community needs to buy one thing, buy a bulldozer. You build a big, wide, just keep building guards around your place. Dirt doesn't burn, so. 
Thank you very much. We're going to turn to the last people on our speakers list. It's uh, microphone 14 and microphone 14. That'd be first uh, Chief Byron Lewis, followed by Chief Harvey McLeod. Uh, I do know uh, that we and we thank uh, the Attorney General, uh, Honorable Jody Rabel Wilson, for joining us. Uh, we will be getting to her just right after these last questions and responses. So, microphone 14, please. Uh, Byron Lewis, Chief Lee Okanagan, man. Uh, there's a number of, uh, you know, things, our issues that we actually have to look at as First Nations, especially when it comes into emergency plan. Uh, this year was probably the first year we didn't have to deal with wildfires, but we had to deal with flooding. I'm just going to ask again, please, I need your cooperation. Your conversations are carrying to the front. So if you need to discuss, to please remove yourself or otherwise please participate in this assembly and respect this important discussion that is happening right now. Thank you so much. Please proceed. And uh, one of the issues that we had actually dealt with wasn't under, you know, a provincial plan, but it was a community-based emergency plan that we were able to actually uh, uh, to bring into uh, full force with uh, EMBC. And for the balance of the season, it worked quite well, and uh, we're looking at how we can actually upgrade that. But there's a number of points I think that really needs to be brought up. And one of that is, and I encourage everyone to read uh, the paper that was submitted by Grand Chief Ed John, First Nation Summit Political Executive, July 28, 2017. I think you get, it's, it's well worth reading. And uh, based upon that, I think there's some of the things that really needs to be looked at is I agree totally with that concept that the Canadian bilateral agreement needs to be re reviewed because it excludes First Nations right out of the picture of uh, how that's going to be done and more or less delegates that authority down to the province. And that is what we learned through our experience. And uh, the other one is when we're talking about uh, for First Nations being prepared to look at full integration into emergency planning in the province, that uh, this will take a government -wide, or a whole of government approach because we're going to need to be able to access funding from a lot of different other sources, just not from the Department of Indian Affairs. And, uh, you know, that I, I will say that is probably one of our biggest problems in the past because it's been only one department that supposedly is supposed to look after all our needs. And uh, if you actually look at Infrastructure Canada and looking at how you can actually access funding for that, well, this is the kicker that it actually goes through the Minister of, uh, Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, or Modi, in the province of British Columbia that provides Infrastructure Canada uh, with uh, uh, a list, and they are the ones that identify the list of priority projects for funding. So surprise, surprise, if you don't see a First Nation being being mentioned on that. And, uh, you know, I think it's really important that we have to look at how we are uh, able to actually be integrated into the regional emergency uh, plans because, you know, just based upon our community, the emergency plan we have uh, in place, our past experience with wildfires, one in particular was uh, the Salmon River fire where uh, not only were animals of refuge, for crews and for whatnot. So we're, we're already moving towards, uh, you know, being integrated into this overall uh, emergency plan. And I think one of the things in there, again, what I mentioned is INAC and their own policy that makes it impossible for even protection at the community-based level. Because how many people in the room recognize the fact that each of us are only allocated, I think it's 500 liters per day per household. And the reservoirs are based upon this, and if a reservoir is based and you have 20 houses on there, it only covers off that 500 liters per family, and it does not take into consideration emergency requirements for fire protection. At one moment this summer, or the previous summer, the reservoir that we had on our reserve was, uh, you know, uh, based upon this formula, we had exactly 40 minutes in that reservoir for fire protection. And, you know, when you're dealing with four fires in the community, or in, especially in the interior, 45 minutes is something that...
direction, and that is the truth. And I think this whole thing is that we really need to take in the, you know, take into account. And again, I encourage people to uh, read, uh, you know, the proposal that's put forth by Grand Chief Ed John because it talks about uh, what we're talking about is real money in that is about 200 million that would be required, if not more, for that for emergency planning because we've been denied access to infrastructure since, uh, well, let's say in, since Confederation, and now we're actually suffering the effects of it. You know, communities that are basically burnt out by fire or by forest fires are just one example. So I think this needs to be looked at and it needs to be done, and especially not from how it's usually done from the bottom up, but from the top down. And that starts with the Canada Bilateral Agreement, and that needs to be reviewed to ensure First Nations are included in it, because we're not. Okay, thank you. Microphone three, please. Thanks, Chief, Thanks, Chief Louis. Um, we certainly recognize that the bilateral agreement needs to uh, um, reflect uh, First Nations in it, and we have made a commitment, and I think you heard Minister Bennett make the commitment yesterday as well, that we need a tripartite approach moving forward um, to ensure that there is a, a clarity of, recog uh, of recognizing uh, the roles in there. So that's one of the pieces we need to work on going forward. And I'll leave it at that just because I know that you're trying to move the agenda along. We are. Uh, I understand. I had cut off the speakers list, and Chief Spahan has just added himself to it. I will uh, obviously. This is an important discussion. I'm going to continue. Uh, I certainly had already acknowledged that Char Chief Harvey McLeod was on that, so we'll go to you, Chief Harvey. We'll go to Ch you, Chief Spahan. We'll allow for, I believe, uh, Grand Chief Ed John. Did you have? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and we got a lot of stuff going on. This is important. I'm not trying to get in your way. I'm just reminding you of where we're at. Please proceed. Harvey McLeod, Chief Upper Nicola, Okanagan Nation. I just want to start by thanking the panel for being here this morning and to listening to better understand what we as communities are going through. We didn't have the fires this year. We haven't yet. But we did face the, uh, the water and the spring floods, and we learned a lot. Thank God we had a, an emergency plan. Thank God that we got a pre-op emergency number. Thank God that we found out that there was assistance available to the community via um, an agreement between the feds and the province to assist communities like ours that were going through a situation like ours. That wasn't learned until after the fact. What we learned is something that we've been preparing ourselves for. We know that what we faced this spring, it will come again. It probably will come next year, if not next year, the year after with the water. And what we want to start talking about, and it'll need a lot of discussion, not only with our community, and not only with the federal government or the provincial government, but the other water users and the land users in the area. The water's gonna come down. There's nothing to hold it back anymore. The beetle bug took everything that uh, the water or the snow to hold uh, the snow in the mountains, and it's not there anymore. We talked about 20 years ago about a water management plan for the Nikola. And that water management plan, a lot of effort was made by the municipality of Merritt, the TNRD, and the First Nations communities in the Nikola that included all of the ranchers on what are we going to do to control the water in a Nikola. And that, a lot of effort was made into that plan and it was shelved. And a nice, beautiful dam was built in Nikola. Um, and that dam doesn't do us any good. It doesn't assist um, anybody that lives above that dam. Thank God that the city of Merritt is below it because they can close the dam and save the city of Merritt, but we get flooded out. 
So we need to go back and have a look at that and look at preparing. If we're talking about preparing for emergency, that is one of the areas that we're going to have to have a look at, the prevention. And also to have a look at communities like ours that live on a floodplain and the issues of living on a floodplain. We don't have uh, pipes carrying away all of our sewage and everything. We've got septic tanks. And that was one of the big issues that we faced this year. So as we're talking and dialoguing, let's put that on the agenda as well. White Limland. All right, so we're going to, we're going to go to microphone number 16. Madam Chair. And Squash Lee Spahan, Cook Bay of Insulatku. Lee Spahan, Chief of the Quarter Indian Band. Um, <clears throat> as you heard uh, Chief Harvey say that in the Nicola we didn't get impacted as with forest fires this year. But um, what did impact my community and always does is the closure of the Cuckahalla Highway. Every time there's an accident between Merritt and the Kingsville turnoff, they redirect all traffic to go through the Coldwater Indian Band land. And that's a huge concern for me and my community band members. Because when you have traffic that's used to going the posted speed limit, which is 120, but they're going about 140, 160. And the speed limit through our, through our reserve is, is 60. They ain't going that speed limit. In the years that the highway has been built, there have been two attempted abductions of band members in coal water because the traffic was redirected from the highway through our reserve. So now every time the highway gets closed, the Ministry of Transportation and Highways calls me. But I've asked many times to have the RCMP on site to slow the traffic down which hasn't happened. So those are the concerns that I have of what happens in my community. So I needed to comment on that, and I think there needs to be more discussions and more involvement with us. Cook Stem, thank you. Thank you. Microphone three, please. Thank you, Chief. Emergency Management BC is part of the Ministry of Public Safety and Solicitor General, and I'll take your comments back to the Minister and the Assistant Deputy Minister responsible for policing services and raise this concern for you. Microphone 24, please. Thank you. Uh, not to belabor the point, I really appreciate um, the update. I firmly believe that we need to set aside at least two days um, sometime this fall or winter to do a debrief on emergency um, matters um, in the province relating to the forest fires, the wildfires. As uh, <clears throat> Chief Alphonse said when we visited his community, there, there is no forest in his community. It's the grass that's in the community that causes the fires. Had they left, those houses that he's talking about would have burned. So, you know, there are many, many issues about construction standards that that could be considered. So my suggestion is to, to have uh, that debrief with, with Canada and BC um, and First Nations and, and guests as necessary. Um, really <clears throat> thank you for the information about the money that Red Cross, ra Cross raised this summer and how much of that was spent. Um, <clears throat> I, I really think that um, that, that um, I hope it just doesn't happen to be a big windfall for Red Cross and it's not used for the purposes that it could be used for, particularly in our community. Secondly, um, 
the Federal Minister, uh, Ralph Goodale, um, at the AFNBC meeting in Ottawa indicated that there was, Canada had committed $33 billion over the next 10 years on the climate change, the Green Climate Fund, Green, oper green Energies Opportunities, and that a significant amount of money. The, the proposal that you have in front of you is really only that and it came directly as a result of uh, my and Robert, uh, Bob Chamberlain's visit to, to uh, Clayton, Clayton Co. Um, last summer, Chief Alphonse, to meet with him and his communities and to listen to what was being said and listening on uh, the, the weekly calls um, and finding out there are such tremendous gaps um, in, in relation to First, First Nations. So the $200 million ask um, is really a reiteration of the $200 million that was committed uh, early on uh, for the mountain pine beetle to First Nations because there were $2 billion set aside and $200 million uh, was agreed to be set aside for First Nations. That money never came to our communities. It went to people like, uh, it went to the cities of Prince George, for example, and they received something in a neighborhood of $33 million to improve their airport. Chief Joe Alphonse said they put a whole lot of money into Williams Lake to improve a park, you know, and meanwhile, there's no resources going to the communities to, to, for, 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 um, to prepare plans, to be able to respond, to get equipment, to train, all of that. And so this, this money, it really is, say, 200 million is about a million per community over four years, that $250,000 that could be used to help um, develop that, it's, I don't think it's, uh, maybe it's, maybe it's not enough, but some people, oh my God, $200 million, well, you know, um, the reality is that non-Aboriginal communities are provided funding by the province to do the necessary preparation for emergency management. That kind of money from the department, from MAR, was confirmed by MAR, is that First Nations do not receive any resources like that. So I think it's wrong. Uh, there's an inequity here that, that needs to be addressed. And this, <clears throat> this amount of money um, um, is something that First Nations uh, in, this, in this province could use. I think the money that we heard um, <clears throat> Catherine saying that that money is going to AFN in Ottawa to do capabilities and capacities assessment. Put that money in British Columbia to our communities to be able to do that assessment, not to put it into Ottawa. Put it into the region. We have finesse that can do that work. We have our communities who can do that work. And we can set up a small task force of our leaders who can lead that work, those who have had direct experience in this. So um, <clears throat> I agree with Chief Joe. Uh, this is like any other, other resource that should be where First Nations should be consulted and. There should be discussions about how, how those resources are used. That the question would be to, be to be seen Canada, what did Canada pay to the province this summer to protect our communities? We know what the Red Cross amount is. We may don't know, maybe we don't know what Canada's paid under the MOU to BC to, to pr provide these services. So let me leave it at that. Just by way of explanation on this proposal that's in front of you, the recommended actions are just that, recommended actions. There's seven points and some next steps that could be undertaken. Um, use it as a framework as you wish. We can move forward in ensuring that the, the main thing is to get resources into our communities. That, that was key this summer. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone number four, please. Just quickly wanted to add, um, you know, I think it's time that First Nations Calls British Columbia, we establish our own emergency response teams, organizations, I think EMBC and Red Cross, I think we're very thankful for the work that they've done, are doing um, throughout the summer and as we continue to move forward and a lot of good people, but you know, we're First Nation people and we, we take pride in the fact that we, we want our own organizations and I think we have the capacity I believe in our people and I think, you know, it's time we set that up and instead of offloading everything to, to other organizations, 
It's time we step up, step up to that plate, take ownership. This, this is self-government. We have to move in this area. So I'm 100% there in my community. We're going to be pushing for, for fire center, evacuation center, fire training. Evacu th these are all things we need. So, you know, um, um, I, I strongly <coughs> encourage that. Um, my last comment, I want to congratulate everybody that got elected in. And if we got 70, 70 chiefs on one side, 70 chiefs on the other, there's a tie. I say we settle it traditional way, game of lahal right in the middle of that floor. <laughs> yeah. wish, wish, wish either one of the chiefs um, good luck. Thank you. So uh, let's show some appreciation to our panel and each and every one of you for this very important discussion. I regret we did not have more time to dedicate it. I did bump things around and I really want to thank Fisheries for allowing me to bump them to this afternoon. Um, for our panels, I do have a token of appreciation for each and every one of you. I just ask you to come this way. Again, thank you very much to Chief Dalton Silver, Jordan Point, and uh, Cliff Leo Sr. for accommodating us. Uh, I do realize we are a little bit, uh, we're just bumping everything and rearranging everything. We have election, a second ballot to go to, or we're going to get back to you in just a little bit right after our next presenter on how that's going to roll out exactly. We'll have the electoral officer come and speak with you about that. But right now, and I want to thank her for being on time and in the house, it is my pleasure to welcome to the podium Honourable Jody Wilson-Raybould, the Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, to address you. Thank you. Thank you. How are you? Excellent. Good. Well, Gail good after, is it afternoon? Good day. <laughs> How is everybody doing? Uh, first of all, I, I just want to acknowledge all of the elders, the matriarchs, the chiefs, the hereditary chiefs, uh, ladies and gentlemen, young people that are here. Um, thank you for, for welcoming me um, to Musqueam, and I would certainly like to acknowledge Musqueam territory. It is very um, good to be back in this house. Uh, of course, recognize the Coast Salish uh, peoples of Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. Um, thank you for having me uh, at uh, the BC AFN AGM. And uh, like many of you, this is not uh, the first time that I've had the opportunity to participate at the BC AFN and to engage in, in discussions with all of you. Um, uh, I guess just in, in reflection to start off, um, I know that there's an election going on and um, I hear that it was tied 70-70 and Roshan told me to joke around and say that I'm here to cast the deciding vote on the election. But anyway, I do want to say that um, this is really important and I'm very glad to see so many of you that are here. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, Chief Maureen Chapman and Terry TG uh, for putting your names forward for uh, what I uh, feel is an incredibly important position uh, uh, for British Columbia Indigenous peoples as we move forward in terms of uh, uh, recognition of rights and um, harnessing the transformative period of time that we're in. It certainly was um, a true honor for me to be the regional chief for a couple of terms and what I learned from all of the leaders uh, sitting around this table uh, was the determination, the resilience that uh, Indigenous peoples in British Columbia have and um, the solutions that we have here in British Columbia that we advanced in terms of uh, the province, in terms of the federal government and it's that knowledge and, and those teachings that I gain from each and every one of you that I take with me uh, in my life, but certainly also um, foundational to my work as the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of Canada. 
So again, let me uh, just say congratulations to, I understand, the new BCFN Board of Directors, and I imagine you're going to go into another round of voting, so you really probably don't want to listen to me talk for too long, but I'm really pleased to be here to give a bit of an update as to what we are doing as a federal government, and certainly feel like this is somewhat of a homecoming for me coming back here to listen to some of the discussions around the, the fires and listening to Chief Joel Fonts. Um, but to talk to you um, and to hear from you, hopefully, about the tremendous work that's happening in British Columbia, the tremendous work that's happening across the country in, as I said, what is a truly a period of transition. And I know that many people, including myself, are calling it an era of recognition. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, rights recognition and nation rebuilding. And it won't sound too unfamiliar to you, as I think the same messages I delivered when I was standing before you as regional chief. But I'm now standing before you as a Minister of the Crown and obviously a proud Kwakwakiwak woman. Um, and the perspectives and thoughts um, that uh, I have in both those capacities, I feel are in full alignment with the work, the ongoing work that uh, each and every one of you are doing in your communities. So just in terms of um, um, the messages um, that have been delivered, that I've delivered, that many of you have delivered in this room um, uh, across the country, um, is that we're in a period where we must ensure that we overcome the colonial reality. The Crown must recognize and implement the title and rights of Indigenous peoples and that absent recognition, true reconciliation will not emerge. Today, as a Minister of the Crown, I deliver this identical message that I've heard from many of you. Colonialism cannot be stemmed and ultimately overcome without recognition and implementation of the inherent rights of Indigenous peoples. Unless and until recognition is entrenched in the laws and policies of this land, and Indigenous nations are actively self-determining and self-governing, exercising their jurisdictions and applying their Indigenous laws, the promise of this country and our Constitution will not have been met. Let me be clear. When I speak of recognition and implementation of title and rights, including historic and modern treaties, I mean what Indigenous peoples have always meant by these terms. That our rights are inherent. That they are not granted or created by a state or a constitution or the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. That they do not require agreement or proof in court to be affirmed. They are grounded in the reality that Indigenous peoples had systems of governments and laws and owned and used the lands which now make up Canada prior to the arrival of Europeans. And that implementing recognition of rights is fundamental to closing the socioeconomic gap, alleviating poverty, ending youth suicide, building healthier families, communities and nations, and ensuring that all generations of Indigenous children to come live in ever-increasing conditions of well-being, prosperity, and opportunity. To be sure, we have reached a truly remarkable moment in, his, in the history of this country. For the first time, we have clear and public acknowledgement that the aspirations of Indigenous peoples and the aspirations of the federal government are one in the same. The goals, challenges, and path of recognition is a shared imperative of the federal government and Indigenous peoples. And this is why we are at a turning point, a moment of transition. Moving beyond denial on the part of the Crown to moving beyond and moving beyond simple protest on the part of Indigenous peoples, there is now a shared responsibility to act and to seize the moment. Now is the time for concrete and urgent action by all of us. And as I have said elsewhere, as I said in Winnipeg at the AGM earlier this year, it will not be easy. 
It will require hard work and change is not automatic. Under the leadership of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, he made the complete renewal of the relationship with Indigenous peoples a central mandate. The federal, and the federal government has already undertaken a number of important steps along the path of recognition. As you know, we have provided unqualified support for the declaration in May of 2016 with a full commitment to its full and effective implementation. We've made effort, initial efforts to move away from the denial-based comprehensive claims policy through establishing new negotiation approaches at recognition and self-determination tables. We've increased efforts to settle and narrow litigation. And in February of 2017, the Prime Minister formed a working group of ministers to review federal laws, policies, and operational practices for alignment with Section 35 of the Constitution and the Declaration. Further, we released principles, 10 principles, respecting the Government of Canada's relationship with Indigenous peoples, which explicitly articulates the shift to recognition by the federal government as the starting point for relations and engagement. And flowing from the recommendations of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, as Minister Bennett indicated to you yesterday, we've commenced the division and the dismantling of INAC into two departments, one focused on rights and relationships and the other on services as part of the necessary decolonization of the federal government. These have been important and necessary internal steps on the path to recognition. They have set the table. Getting the federal house in order, as the prime minister recently said to the United Nations General Assembly, a couple of weeks ago. But as the Prime Minister also reiterated at the UN, to address the true colonial history of Canada, transformative action is still required. In my mind, the fundamental next step is to extinguish the legacy of denial that lies at the heart of federal laws and policies and replace it with the recognition of rights. While the principles we release speak to doing this, they cannot be operationalized by themselves. The same is true for the United Nations Declaration. Words themselves simply are not enough. Action is needed. And together we, in partnership, need to confirm the action we are each going to, actions we are each going to take, the next steps that we're gonna take in the path of recognition and reconciliation. This is a conversation the working group of ministers as well as individual ministers and departments has begun to have with indigenous peoples and groups across the country, including of course with First Nations in British Columbia. This is the conversation that will intensify this small fall. This is the conversation that I expect to lead to tangible legislative and policy change in the near future and of course new patterns of relations. So in the rest of the time I have available let me share with you a few of my initial thoughts about the key elements of a recognition and implementation of rights framework that is evolving through the many discussions that we are having. First, Recognition of rights must be affirmed and enforced as a required standard of conduct for all federal government officials in their relations with Indigenous peoples, including in decision making, <coughs> negotiations, and treaty and agreement implementation. As you will recall, such a step was one aspect of the proposed British Columbia Recognition and Reconciliation Act in 2008-2009 that ultimately was not achieved in this province for a number of reasons that we have all learned from. Denial of rights is the primary source of massive costs and lost opportunities for Indigenous peoples and for all Canadians. It delays the advancement of improved relations between the Crown and Indigenous peoples that would see the alleviation of the often tragic social conditions Denial inevitably embroils us in modes of discourse and interaction that are limited, incremental, 
inefficient, transactional, overly process-orientated and often unsatisfying and even offensive. In short, confrontational. This is what happens when the starting point of engagement about rights is a denial of their existence, despite their explicit recognition and affirmation in Section 35 of the Constitution. A recognition and implementation of rights framework building upon this government's endorsement of the United Nations Declaration and the release of the principles must advance the next stage of reform by embedding the standard of recognition in all legislation and policy. We expect to be launching a new dialogue and concrete action on shifting and entrenching recognition in the coming weeks. Second, a recognition and implementation of rights framework will need to include the implementation of the standards set out in the United Nations Declaration. Moving further than simple endorsement and support to actual application of the United Nations Declaration in Canada within our constitutional framework. Some of this work has already started, but comprehensive mechanisms needed for implementation are required right now. A range of measures will have to be used, consistent with Article 38 of the Declaration, which reads, quote, states in consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples shall take the appropriate measures, including legislative measures, to achieve the ends of the Declaration, end quote. Third, a recognition and implementation of rights framework will need to contain mechanisms and measures to support nation rebuilding and to facilitate self-determination, including self-government by indigenous peoples, including transition out from under the constraints and impositions of the Indian Act. This, of course, is where there lies significant work that must be done directly by each of you as Indigenous peoples. Self-determination includes deciding your own political structures and reconstituting as nations in ways aligned with your priorities, histories, traditions, and customs. It also includes reinvigorating your Indigenous laws and decision-making approaches so that the relationship between Indigenous peoples and the lands and resources in their territories can be fully and properly expressed. And I know for a fact that nation rebuilding is not going to work and the federal government, if the federal government is tasked of doing it for you, the federal government cannot do it for you. Indeed, the Crown thinking it knows what's best is what led to the imposition of colonial structures of the Indian Act in the first place, structures that First Nations must now themselves overcome. Canada has many responsibilities and duties in the transition, but for this to happen, Indigenous nations need to work internally and need to work together. It is only our peoples that can reconstitute and self-determine the path forward. Moving beyond the rhetoric and stated as simply as I can, Canada needs to know who and what is recognized. On the path to self-determination, there will necessarily need to be incremental steps to dealing with dismantling the colonial legacy. Further, I know well that different nations are on distinct paths and in various stages of advancing this work. But for all nations, it requires asking and answering hard questions, such as, again, who will you choose, or how will you choose to organize as proper title and rights holders? What structures and purposes or processes of self-government will you build? What mechanisms will you use to express and articulate your indigenous laws? How will you ensure your citizens are supportive and informed of the work of reconstitution and rebuilding your governments? This is the work that I know the nations in British Columbia are ready for and can lead. Of course, Canada does also have a role to play in this work. Canada is not a passive bystander waiting for all nations to somehow reconstitute in the wake of colonialism or that there is a one-size-fits-all post-colonial door to walk through. No, when a nation determines and brings its framework or its proposal, if you like, for self-government, 
forward, it is the role of Canada to help facilitate that transition. This includes providing support for communities individually and as part of nations to rebuild and ensuring the space for the operation of Indigenous jurisdiction and law. Canada must ensure that areas of co-decision co making and lawmaking are clear and that there is a fiscal relationship that is designed to properly support the operation of Indigenous government. Canada also has a role to play in supporting the institutions that Indigenous peoples have created or may wish to create to support the work of transition to self-government. These are the institutions that support nation rebuilding and that can transcend a particular nation or group or will ultimately enable services to be delivered directly by Indigenous governments under their own laws and authorities. That will enable the removal of federal departments from such a role. Institutions like FNESC, like the Health Authority, FMB, the FNTC, the FNFA, and so on. Fourth, a recognition and implementation of, implementation of rights framework must accelerate the shift from patterns of conflict to those of deep and constructive collaboration and cooperation. While the courts have played a pivotal role over the past many decades in forcing advancement and consideration of Indigenous rights, adversarial court processes are not designed to effect transformation in the relations we all want. They will not build new political, social, and economic arrangements or remove the legacy of denial from federal laws and policies. Nor can courts reconstitute Indigenous nations or rebuild Indigenous governments. As Attorney General of Canada, I will continue to take steps to move cases out of court, including in the next little while issuing a directive on litigation involving Indigenous peoples. We both need to do work in this regard and I look forward to doing this together. And finally, moving from conflict to collaboration also requires a climate where we can build trust. This is something which for good reason has always been in short supply in Indigenous Crown relations. To build trust, we need to foster a climate of accountability where actions meet words. Being accountable means being transparent we will have to be clear with everyone how historic and modern treaties are being implemented. Same for the United Nations Declaration, as well as actions that support and facilitate self-government. I hope that the five or six points that I've mentioned resonate with you. Um, I hope that I have been somewhat clear about my intentions and the opportunities, although there's challenges with those opportunities, that is presented in this time in our history to the Chiefs of British Columbia and the leaders of British Columbia. I look forward to working with you on a recognition of rights and implementation framework. This is what I advocated for as Regional Chief of the British Columbia Assembly of First Nations. Leaders before me have advocated for this. And now I know that each and every one of you around this table is advocating for it. This is the time for us to take advantage of this opportunity. Um, I don't know when it's going to come along again, but I invite you to um, be involved, to assist in your community rebuilding and ensure that um, beyond the life of this government, which is going to be a really long life, that we have a framework that ensures the recognition of rights-based approach in legislation. I look forward to doing the work with you. Um, Gala Kusla, thank you for having me and I'm going to go vote. Just kidding. Thank you. Um, sure. What time is it? So, thank you. I was just checking in to make sure uh, I had already had some nods here and there for some questions. I will continue to add to the list, but also understanding, uh, I don't know what the timeline is, but I will go first to microphone number 23, then 17, then 9, and then 16. That's what I have on my list so far. Uh, and then 22. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Puglis, always good to see you. And just want to 
thank you so very much for all the work that you're doing. Um, it's incredibly important, and the opportunity that you speak of with this government, I know that you're a very key and foundational voice within there to push this ahead, and for us to respond to the wake-up call, to respond to the opportunity and do the work that we need to. Um, the one thing that I'm, I'm curious of is when there's reference to the number of First Nations or nations that are identified in the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People, and it's a rather small number. And I know the discussion here in British Columbia about what constitutes a nation is, is varied across the province. And so my, my question is, uh, within, like, when the government considers those nations identified within, the, within our cap, are we to consider then the Kwakwakiwak nation as the vessel to advance? Because I've stated this before, um, as you know, a representative of the Kwikwasutinuk and the Hukwatmis peoples of the Muskamak Zawadinuk, we have a whole host of origin stories within the Kwikwasutinuk and the Hukwatmis. And so we quite clearly view ourselves as a nation based upon the title stories and the territories. And so when I heard about the RCAP numbers, I was kind of wondering, well, if we're to pursue this, is this anticipated as the Kwakwakiwak nation advancing collectively, or is there space for a collective, like the Muskamak Zawadenuk people, a collective of four nations which are recognized culturally within the Kwakwakiwak people? And keep up the good work. Thank you. So uh, we're going to go, she's made notes on that question. We're going to go to microphone number 17, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chief Wilf Adam, Lake Babine. Nice to see you, Jody. It must, have, must be really hard, you know, enforcing the laws of uh, this land and being First Nations. But sometimes it must be really good to do that. Uh, I'm part of the... Uh, table, the champions table by, by this group, the uh, BCAFN. And <clears throat> there was a paper that was done by Jeff Plant. You know, I do not usually agree with Jeff in many ways, but what he uh, presented to us at the last uh, uh, table meeting was essentially a, a paper on who has the last say. Uh, in an agreement with uh, First Nations or otherwise around British Columbia or Canada. And his proposal <clears throat> is to do away with the governments having the last say in any agreements. I just want to see what your thoughts on that is. And uh, I know that uh, we, when he told us that when he proposed that uh, paper, I found it very interesting from a, from that uh, particular person that you know he fought tooth and nails with the First Nations in this province, and to have him uh, come up with a proposal is just you know that there should be some kind of uh, agreement between governments and Canada without or uh, Canada or the BC governments without Canada, BC, saying that, you know, they will have the last say. So, your thoughts on that. Thank you. Microphone number nine, please. Then we're going to go 16, 22, and 24. We're going to try and get through that. Just under saying, I was, um, was share with me, she does have to leave at 1230. We do have to provide her a chance to respond. So, uh, microphone nine. Uh. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Honourable Minister, it's, uh, you know, as listening to you speak and understanding our long history with Canada, 150 years of uh, legal genocide, the laws that have been used against us, you know, we can start to listen them all off in terms of how they banned the potlatch, we can go on into all of that, but what I hear you saying and what I think is really important, there's an opportunity with this government to turn that page. 
And the father of this prime minister, uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, when we were fighting the constitutional battle, at one point, uh, because of the Supreme Court decision uh, that was done with the NISCA, he actually said that, yeah, you maybe you do have rights. And then he proceeded to try to patriate the Constitution. And we fought really hard in that patriation battle to ensure that Section 35, or the recognition of Indian nations, was a part of the fabric of Canada. We fought really hard. That Canada is not built on the English or the French, it's also built on our Indian nations. So what Canada needs to do, and I like what you're saying, uh, but you need to think about this like what they did after the Second World War in Europe, uh, the Marshall Plan. A very specific plan to rebuild the economies and the fabric of the European countries that were destroyed by war. Because if you think about what's happened to us, it's the same thing. We've been at war with Canada in terms of the land and resources, our children just go on and on and on. So I think Article 39 of UNDRIP really speaks to that, and you need to think about that as an actual plan, because this government could not be there two years from now. We need something substantive in terms of some kind of rebuilding of our nations that's built on recognition and restitution. And you're saying that, but I think we need something that's going to actually happen. And so think about Article 39 of the UN Declaration that talks about the states, you know, us accessing resources from the states and technical assistance for the rights contained within UNDRIP. We need a program like the Marshall Plan to rebuild our nations, and we do have a table with Canada. And I hope that maybe next week when I'm in Ottawa, I can actually have the opportunity to speak with you about what we're doing there. It would be an opportunity, and, and thank, I thank you for the work and continue doing what you're doing. I know it must be difficult. Kokshan, thank you. Thank you. Microphone 16, please. Good morning. Unsquash, please, behind. Cook, be a in the Gatlam. I'd like to thank Musqueam for allowing us to do this important work in your house. Um, Thank you for your presentation, Jody. I asked a question yesterday to uh, Minister Carolyn Bennett, and I'd like to ask you the same question. As you know, our band won a court case against your government in Kinder Morgan a few weeks ago regarding the existing Trans Mountain Pipeline through our reserve. The court found that the Minister of Indian Affairs and Northern Development, Bernard Valcourt, <clears throat> breached the government's fiduciary duty to our band by approving a 2007 transfer of the pipeline easement to Kinder Morgan against our best interests. Given the new relationship you are trying to build with us, Will you commit here today not to seek leave to appeal the decision to the Supreme Court of Canada? Cookstrom. Mm -hmm. Microphone number 22, and then we're wrapping up with microphone 24. Hadi Jody. Chief Queen Alawine from the Chislata Carrier Nation. I had, yesterday I had asked the question and I, I I just want to um, to revoice the question on the floor, and that is in regards to the murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. Um, when we were we were going through the inquiry, and one of the uh, lawyers had mentioned that when there's um, a missing person, that the files are kept um, sealed so that nobody can have those records and I was just wondering how can the federal government um, support us in perhaps suggesting how we as leaders can reverse that so that families and law lawyers of the families can actually access the um, the files um, on their missing family members Masicho and thank you for all the work that you do for our First Nations people Thank you. Microphone 24, please. 
And so I have to stand to see you, Jody. Oh. I really appreciate um, your comments uh, this morning. Um, they're absolutely bang on, in my opinion. I listened to the Prime Minister's speech to the United Nations General Assembly from September 21. I listened to it twice, and it's amazing the direction that Canada has committed to move. And uh, for me, um, having been involved in this from, from a very early age in my young life, but into, into law school, but following that, uh, fight for what Wayne's talking about, the inclusion of uh, a constitutional provision for First Nations, Indigenous peoples, Aboriginal peoples in the 1982 Constitution. Um, those 17 words in Section 35 have been opened a massive door for us in, in the relationship that, that we have. And since then, we have been looking for this moment in our history, in this province. As I said, the stars are aligned in British Columbia. We have a provincial government taking uh, like-minded measures as the federal government is. And it, we're moving in the right direction. And it's taken us a long time to get to this. Uh, the message at the top with the current prime minister and yourself as the minister of justice is absolutely welcome. We need to see that translated into ensuring that uh, officials that we have to deal with in the region for, for example, at some of the negotiating tables, they don't want to use the words, say, reference to the UN Declaration or reference parts of articles of the Declaration in memorandums or anything like that. It's ridiculous, but uh, they, they need to get somebody needs to send a message down to them and say, look, that time of denial is over the recognition that we are talking about these provisions should be built into some of these agreements that are now being discussed and negotiated. And, and if those people downtown at Indian Affairs or FTNO um, are not in the loop, they need to be. And if they refuse to do it, they should all be fired. I mean, that's, that's my humble opinion, as I like to express it. So today, um, I stand in, in recognition and in honor of the work that you have done. As a, as a regional chief, but now as a Minister of Justice and the Attorney General in, the, in, in turning the federal government's position around to something that now is closely aligned to where we have been uh, stating for so long in this country. And, and I think we owe you a debt of gratitude for making that happen. Thank you. Thank you very much for all the questions. Thank you to uh, our Honourable <laughs> Jody Wilson-Raybould for accommodating us. I invite her back to the podium to now respond. Well, thank you for, um, thank you for all the comments and the questions and uh, answering them certainly would require, fulsomely would require more than um, the time I have between now and, and my expiry date of 1230. Um, but I, I mean, just, to touch on, on each of them briefly, and there's some commonality or threads that run through the questions. To um, Chief Chamberlain, to your comments about RCAP, um, the 60 to 80 nations that was mentioned in the body, I would encourage everybody to read RCAP. Um, but um, to answer your questions or perhaps provide you with some, some solace, <laughs> um, the Government of Canada is not gonna determine who the nation is. Um, it's up to Indigenous peoples, communities, nations to determine that for themselves. I mean, certainly we're gonna to have to have conversations about it, but uh, um, as I said in my remarks, I'm looking forward to hearing from, from you about substantive plans, solutions, um, how you want to organize, it may or may not be organized in traditional nation um, linguistic divides. Um, but again, this is, uh, we're looking to you to determine who you are, um, tell us who you are. Um, sounds so weird, I'm talking as the government of Canada here. But uh, I'm, and to Opid's uh, initial comments, and, and speaking as the, as Mojag, as I like to refer to myself, um, and being an Indigenous person, um, it is hard, of course it's hard. Um, but it is so important, in my view, that we have individuals individuals around this table that are advocating for rights, that are advocating for community members that can't advocate for themselves. Um, 
this is the hardest job that I've ever had. I've never worked so hard in my entire life, but it is fundamentally worthwhile, and I know that each and every one of you around the table can say you work really hard too. We need to ensure, um, in order for us to propel our country forward, that we substantively look to the institutions of government, um, the laws and the policies of the federal government, and change them based on uh, recognition as opposed to denial. And then the real opportunity, and this speaks to Wayne's uh, comments as well, around Section 35 and around how much Indigenous peoples and nations fought for Section 35. Section 35 is not an empty box of rights. It's a full box of rights, and the expression of Section 35 has been suppressed for 35 years, and we are finally, um, as, a, as a government of Canada and as Indigenous nations across the country, are going to give expression to those rights, breathe life into Section 35, the United Nations Declaration, and how we do that is to translate them into practical and meaningful benefits on the ground in communities. Um, I, again, think everybody should read the 46 articles of the Declaration Cookby. Um, there are many important ones. The ones that I think are most important are three and four. Um, I also think that the ways and means <laughs> to support financially Indigenous governments is incredibly important, and that's articulated in the Declaration too. I think that speaks to the economic development that's required in order to rebuild communities. Um, who has the last say? Uh, I like to move away from who has the last say to look at building or working towards consent-based decision-making, moving away from confrontation and being adversarial, but actually having meaningful discussions about territories with Indigenous communities, with um, all jurisdictions. I fundamentally believe in um, the evolving nature of cooperative federalism, and that includes the federal government, provincial governments, underneath provincial governments, municipal governments, but it equally includes Indigenous governments in this evolving nature of our federation that is going to transform it for the better. Um, with respect, um, Lee, I, I hear you on cold water. Um, uh, as the Attorney General, I hope you can respect that I'm not going to speak on that in front of this. I know that we'll have um, additional conversations and I'm happy um, to do that um, either myself or through my, uh, my officials. So thank you for raising that with me. Um, in terms of murder and missing um, women uh, and getting access to files, um, I know that and recognize that the, the inquiry has had some challenges lately, that there have been some concerns. One of the things, and you know, I'm one of three ministers that's responsible for the inquiry, uh, but we do work across government, and we want to make sure that the inquiry um, achieves its objectives. And one of the main objectives of the inquiry is to ensure justice for the families, justice for the murdered and, and missing Indigenous women and girls. And if they're, and part of that is to look at the systemic barriers, to look at um, institutions, look at the police, look at files. Um, this was something that was thought about in terms of the drafting of the terms of reference for the murder and the missing uh, inquiry. And um, I'm happy to go back and see, um, the, the inquiry is arm's length, <laughs> so um, I can't go to them all the time, but um, I'm sure that this is something that you advocated for and brought to the, the commissioners, but I'm happy to follow up with you on this specific question. Um, and then I'm um, just in closing to you, Ed, um, thank you for your your comments and of course for your ongoing advocacy on um, the UN declaration and expressing the moment in time that we're in. And um, I think it's really cool that you guys are in an election that you, I mean, it's in spite of the two candidates that tied, it means that people are like um, anxious and wanting to participate and lead the province and BC is always extraordinary. We had a prime or premier that was called a more de cosmos. We had one that lived in fantasy gardens or, um, <laughs> but, but I think for indigenous peoples, like you said, Ed, um, we have, there's a new provincial government and I've had conversations with the premiers, have conversations with Scott Fraser um, and the, the attorney general, David Eby, and there is a lot of commonality in terms of the approaches that we're taking to rights recognition and to um, be able to harness the opportunity that we have here. And whomever wins uh, in the election, I know that uh, the person that, that comes second will certainly be advocating um, as strongly as if they were the regional chief. So 
Yeah, La Casa, thank you so much for, uh, for your attention and I look forward to seeing you all again at the Fiscal Institutions meeting tomorrow if anybody's here. Uh, uh, Indeed, uh, thank you for that plug. A continued dialogue on defining a new First Nations fiscal relationship with the Crown will be here tomorrow. It starts at 9 a.m. Uh, Leah George Wilson will be chairing that meeting and it, there will be breakfast provided at 8.30. So just letting you know about that. Some business to look after. So uh, I'm going to invite up the uh, BCAFM board to come and address you at this time. You guys will be here soon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We've had a couple of questions in regards to the tie that just happened. Some chiefs have asked if uh, we would be accepting additional proxies. And um, it was a bit of a debate. Unfortunately, we will have to follow our existing uh, bylaws. In section 26 on page 13, all of you have it in your kit. Um, it does state that voting and otherwise participating in the society meeting by proxy is permitted where a representative of the member gives written notice of his or her proxy to the regional chief prior to the commencement of the meeting. Except no one, no one shall carry more than one proxy and a proxy may not carry another proxy. Additionally, on page 32 of the governance manual, that is the current manual we are mandated to follow, it sets out that in the event of a tie between the last two candidates after the ballot, another ballot shall be held. The polls are open until two. In the unlikely event, there is still a tie between the last two candidates after the tie-breaking ballot is counted, the electoral officer shall cast the deciding vote by flipping a coin. That is in our governance. That is what will happen should we go to a tie again. I will say, if a chief who did, was not here this morning appears now till 2 o'clock, they will be able to vote. We cannot accept additional proxies, though. So. Everybody vote, please, and it's all in accordance to our bylaws and constitution. Question from... Thank you. Uh, microphone number 21, please. Um, so, section 26, voting otherwise participating in a society meeting by proxy is permitted. I just want to take note that Section 26 hasn't been practiced today, so I suppose what my my concern and, and my my thinking is, if it's not being practiced today, why are we practicing it now? So that's really what my, my question is in terms of allowing more proxies, because right today, uh, if we did practice this from right from the get-go, we wouldn't be here. I think that's essentially my point. Thank you. I'm now going to turn my, so we, the polls are open. They are open until two. We have um, one uh, <coughs> matter we need to look after as well. Um, I've got very briefest amount of details whispered in my ear, so I'm going to hopefully be, uh, we'll all be filled in by Councillor Wendy Grant John, if she could please identify herself and come forward. Or I don't. <laughs> You'd be good at identifying her. <laughs> uh, Mike, one second, please. You also have minister Yes, we have lots of. We have many, many, many things on the go right now, and I apologize if I've missed anything. I've been bombarded in the last 10 minutes, um, but I do also want to make note. It was noted that um, Honorable Katrine Conroy, who is the Minister of Children and Family Development, is here. She did uh, want to let you know that she's here. Uh, she came to listen to the Federal Attorney General, and she also want to let you know if you want to engage with her one-on-one, -on -one, she is here. You could stand there. She is waving at us all. Thank you very much for joining us today. Sorry. 
I was asked to bring you forward, and I don't know. Maureen, 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 can I please get your assistance? Um, I'm going to go back to the floor because I didn't mean to cut you off. I just was getting bombarded. 21, please. You had a question, sir? Not you, uh, the tribal chair, but the fellow next to you. You had raised your hand. I didn't know what it was about. Yeah, so um, uh, proxy for Patrick Michelle, <coughs> Kanaka Bar. Can, I'm sorry. Proxy for, proxy for Kanaka Bar, uh, Patrick Michelle. My name's Cole. Um, I don't and think you, you addressed- You also have a candy in your mouth that's making it hard to hear. Thank sorry, you. Sorry, I've got a cold. Those are halls. Um, the, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, I don't think you addressed the, the statement that was just made, that there are people who are voting right now that would be in contravention to Section 26, which is what you're standing on, that proxies can't vote. You're standing on a, on a, on a piece of uh, wording that we're not presently using today. So there are, there are many proxies that came in after the start of the meeting and voted today. And now you're saying that this, this, the thing that you're quoting that says proxies can't come anymore, new proxies, is from the start of the meeting. Pro new proxies came in today and have voted after the start of the meeting, already, today. And we're not talking historical precedent, we're talking today's precedent. Thank and you're you. using a rule that we're not following today. So can uh, somebody address that before we continue? Absolutely, I want to be clear that I'm going to turn it over to the Board of Directors for that question, as it's not a question for me. Uh, good afternoon. So. Uh, the question on the floor is why are we accepting or why is the uh, electoral officer accepting uh, new proxies when the uh, governance bylaw uh, outlines that the cutoff is at uh, prior to the meeting. So we had talked to the candidates um, and heard their thoughts. We also uh, sought some legal counsel for, um, for this question. And uh, the bylaws do state that the proxies and the procedure for the proxies is outlined in the governance manual. So whether or not we're going to um, act outside of the manual and determine new procedures today is, is the question that's being asked. So uh, we are still as a board of directors taking a look at that question and we'll come back to the floor but obviously it's something that is very complex and uh, we do need a, a bit of time to, to review that thank you microphone number eight please Thank you yourself, Tyrone McNeil, proxy for Seabird Island. Uh, being actively involved in the governance review committee, I'm familiar with what the suggested election processes are for the VCEFN. However, under the current rules, the, much of this is tasked to the election electoral officer. I don't think it's appropriate that the chair or the board respond to these questions. The electoral officer has a very clear, prescriptive, and concise mandate on how to conduct a BCAFN election. Um, the, if, the, if the rules are clear and black and white, he should present that. If the, if the rules are somewhat gray or, or muddled or whatever, it's his decision to make and which way to rule. Uh, so I'd like to clarify that for, for the board and for the chiefs in assembly here. Uh, just a reminder, we've got a process in place and that process must be followed. We've got one individual tasked and contracted to fulfill that electoral, electoral mandate and he should be called for a decision or called to task on it, one of the two. Heichka. Thank you. I'm just aware there's, an, um, there's a number of things going on right now and I just need to check in over here for a minute. Um, and I'll be right back with you.
So rather than have this be an electoral debate happening here right now, I'm going to defer it back to the electoral officer and, and, and encourage those who need to speak with him to go there or to the board. At this point in time, we do need to continue on. I understand what's going on uh, around questions around the election process and proxies. But right now, uh, we also need to get you fed and we uh, also need to continue on. Um, and we have bumped and bumped. Uh, some things are going to fall off this agenda. We understand that. I'm going to turn once more to the Board of Directors for a moment. And again, thank you for your cooperation. We're going to just, um, we're doing some follow-up. Obviously, the polls are going to remain open as long as this is an outstanding issue. Uh, we will check in with you, absolutely. Um, as uh, both of our candidates, we will check in with both of our candidates about this. We're going to proceed to lunch as I don't want us to get into a hangry situation either. So thank you so much for your cooperation we're going to take a very short recess and get back to each of you so i'm going to turn it over to police police thank you very much to um bless our table first of all uh won't take too much more of your lunch time um but uh, uh before i carry on with uh, uh the song I was approached by my chief, Wayne Sparrow, on behalf of my relative, Ali. She was uh, in a, uh, her, her, she's had family members that were um, a bad incident in their home with a fire. Over in Nanaimo, her half-sister and her niece passed away from this fire. Her dad is from Campbell River, and because they resided outside of Campbell River, or sorry, Bella Bella, Bella Bella was not, wasn't offering to help financially with the funeral costs, with everything, and also there's a, a there's two, surviving sons, 15 and 17. So my chief asked AFN for a little bit of help and also thank AFN for ask, uh, uh, allowing us to take a few more moments. But at certain times like this, when our community, one of our community members has a loss of family, we put out a drum and ask for help, donations, to help for the surviving sons, to help with family, to make their way to Bella Bella, to, to, to you know, for all the ex expenses of funerals and everything like that. So um, after, after I sing the table song, I'll, I'll place the drum out for a few moments and ask for uh, your help and donations to help my cousin out to make her way to her family and everything. So with that, I'll continue on with the table song and uh, thank you for your time.
Champion. Also, um, our, uh, our uh, Chief and Council has designated someone to uh, make a collection in our own, our own village here, so uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you very much. We, uh, we're going to take a short recess. I ask you to kindly assist by helping us reconvene at 1.30 uh, so that we can continue on. Uh, it's just a short recess, and we will reconvene at 1.30. So it's currently 12.48 according to my time. Thank you.